Mic test one, two. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Champion Life Center Scarborough. I hope you guys are all enjoying uh, our, our summers almost over, especially for the, the kids. I know as parents, uh, usually they have nothing to do, right? Well, they're not at school, or if they're not they're working, they're usually just at home, and we kind of give them things to do at home, right? Maybe we give them certain chores, maybe cut the grass, or maybe uh, wash the dishes, or maybe cook. So when the parents come home, there's less work for them to do. And uh, hopefully, they're not just on social media the whole time, right? And uh, I mean, I, I, my, my kids, well, they don't stay home alone, but I mean, uh, I kind of give them chores as well. It doesn't work out that well. I mean, I, I, won, I even try to pay them, and it still doesn't work. But no, when I, when I ask them to do maybe just do a, like wash the dishes, they kind of, and I'll say, you know, I'll give you $2 maybe, you know, do, do a, every chore you'll get $2. And she'll say yes. And after that first day, it, it, it just like, it never happened. And then another, my other daughter, the younger one, she's like, um, if I ask her to do something, maybe not a chore, but maybe to brush her teeth or, or maybe to even take a shower, she'll be the type that will say yes but she actually never did it. So she's kind of like a sneaky type. And so today, you know, my, and today I'm going to be talking about, in the Bible, about a parable of the two sons. And, uh, you know, maybe as parents we can relate to this story because, you know, if you're a father or a mother and you try and get, like I was talking about how we try to get our kids to do chores, there's one, like there's this, this one son that they're, they're kind of rude and you don't want to do anything about it. They'll be saying, yeah, no, I don't want to do those chores you're asking me to. I, I'm, I'm so busy. I got friends. I got social media. I've got something to post. Or there's another child they will say, yes, mom. Yes, sir. I will do it for you. And it didn't happen. No, but even if you're not a parent, maybe you're one of the, those sons, you can relate as well because maybe you're like one of those two boys, either, either you're just rude and say, no, whatever, I want to do my own thing, or you could be one, the other one saying yes, but it only was the words that came out of your mouth, and there was actually no action. Or maybe you're a little bit of both. You know, for, in, in my experience as a kid, you know, I'm not just sharing this to you guys, but you know, it's in my life as well. I mean, when I was in, uh, when, uh, during... While well, I was living with my mom, I think I, li- yeah, I was living with my mom for a few years. Now, obviously, how am I going to survive? But when I was living with her, there's times that, you know, when school break, she kind of gave me chores. But you know what? I would just say, you know what? Nah, this is boring. Or, you know what? I can't do this. Or sometimes I'll say yes, and I never really did it. No, it's easier that way. You kind of like lie, right? Because, you know, we try to make them proud and make them happy. So maybe we think about, maybe let's just say yes, even though we didn't. So at least they don't ask us again. And, you know, that's not a good thing. So, but, you know, that's how I was. So today, as we read our scripture, it's important that, you know, the scripture, because it gives us, this scripture is going to give us a clear understanding about what God wants from us. And our text will be from Matthew 21, 28 to 32. So let me just read this for you. It says, But what do you think? But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second son and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you, that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Verse 32, John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe in him, but tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not relent and believe him. Let me just 
pray. Father, we thank you today that we can hear your word. Lord, I pray as you speak your, to your people today that I'm just your messenger. I pray that they will open their spiritual ears and God, that they will be able to um, not be distracted, but Father, hear from you and not from me. Let your word speak truth today and bring conviction to our hearts. I pray that we not leave this place the same, but Father, as we hear your word and you, and you move in us, Father God, that we will be leaving this place a new person and a change of mind and hearts that we can continue to do uh, your kingdom and purpose in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to talk about this parable, this simple parable, but yet it has a lot of meaning and a lot of purpose and, and it directs, gives us direction in our lives. So I'm going to be talking about the context of the parable because, you know, if you read that, you'll be like, who is Jesus speaking to? What are these sons? What is this father? What is a vineyard? Do you guys know what a vineyard is? Okay. Grapes. It's, it's like a farmer, right? A vineyard is where grapes grow. Vine yard. Okay. So the key point in understanding the parable of the two sons comes in defining to who Jesus is speaking. Okay. So we need to look at the overall context of this passage. So if you just read this parable, it won't make a lot of sense. So Matthew chapter 21 begins with Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The whole point of Matthew's gospel is to show how Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. Now, when Jesus enters Jerusalem, the crowd responds by shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, and praises to the king. This might uh, remind you of our Easter presentation, right? Like, usually, I think, when I was writing this down, it just reminded me of us doing the Hosanna, Hosanna, and then I'm going to hear baptizing that. I mean, it brings, the, that's, that's what this is about. So the king's first so this is his first act, okay? Where was I? Yes. So he was talking about, so his triumphant return. So the whole point of Matthew's gospel is to show him the long-awaited Messiah and Hosanna, Hosanna, right? So the king's first act upon entering Jerusalem is to cleanse the temple, which was in Matthew 21, between 12 and 17. So the prior verses, Jesus was overturning the tables of the money changers and the benches of those who were selling things at the temple, right? Jesus was angry, and he went Hulk. Oh, he went Buster, not the Hulk. He didn't turn green, but you know, he, he didn't like what was happening. So afterwards, we see Jesus cursing a fig tree. This was in, still in chapter 21, in verses 18 to 22. Jesus was making a strong symbolic point. No, the fig tree is a symbol, is often a symbol of Israel. So the fact that the tree had leaves but no fruit is symbolic of Israel's religious activity. All the trappings of spirituality but no substance. No, Israel may have had all the leaves of activity but had no fruit of repentance and obedience to God. Which is why Jesus tells them the prostitutes and tax collectors will enter the kingdom ahead of them, which was in verse 31. But I imagine, I know this is a time where we kind of go fruit picking, apple picking, cherry picking, no more strawberry, that's not a fruit. But no, apple, peaches, plums, pears, right? And if we go, we usually, they'll have like lines of trees, right? And we I usually scan which trees or which line has the most fruit, right? If it's just full of leaves, we're going to skip it. And this is what the point is. You know, we may, have like, we may look nice, but if there's no fruit, are we really, really bearing fruit? So that's why Jesus, in the prior verse, he was cursing the tree. Imagine someone, like, if you see somebody standing outside cursing a tree, you might think, what is happening here? So this is Jesus here in the prior verses because, you know, he not only wants us to have the leaves have activity, but he wants the fruit. So Jesus was claiming his kingship and telling the crowds of people who he was the Messiah, the King of Israel. 
his day had come and no longer were, it wasn't a secret anymore that he was the Messiah, okay? And Jesus was calling out the religious hypocrites and giving sinners hope for eternal life. So now we're getting closer to the parable. So now here we are. The parable of two sons was spoken in response to the Pharisees attacking on Christ's authority. So now we're here at Matthew 21 between the verses 23 to 27. The religious authorities, the chief priests and elders. So they were like the community leaders, the judges, the smart people, I guess you could say. You know, they had all of the knowledge. So these were the people. And they were questioning Jesus' authority. He said, who is this Jesus who comes into Jerusalem receiving the praises of the people and drives the money changers out of the temple? So here we are. Just like um, when we watch uh, those uh, Western movies, the Wild West, right? There are those two men left. You know, everything is all closed down. The shops are closed and it's a little dusty. And there's two people on, uh, in the middle of the street and they're ready to go and pull out their guns, right? And then you see like a tumbleweed. That's just for some drama and some effects, right? But usually you see like a tumbleweed moving around. Right? So now, the, now the scene is set for the showdown, for the moment of truth between Jesus and their religious leaders, okay? It is in this context that Jesus tells three parables, the two sons, the tenants, and the wedding feast. But don't worry, I'm just going to be talking about the parable of two sons, so it won't be long. I won't be talking about all the other parables, so just concentrate about this one. Each of these parables told to the Jewish religious leaders, each illustrating their re rejection of Jesus. And each pronounces judgment on Israel, the rejection of their Messiah. So in the parable of two sons, the leaders of Israel are the second son who claimed obedience but did not do the will of the Father. So when the religious leaders and Pharisees asked Jesus who gives him authority, Jesus responded asking them a question before responding with his own answer and fires back. Jesus asked, where did the bat... Where did John the Baptist receive his authority from heaven or men? So this is where the, the, the fight started. The Pharisees were trapped. You know, they were like going crazy. What do I do? What's, what am I going to answer? Because, you know, it's a trick question. If they responded from heaven, they would be admitting that John was right and the Pharisees were wrong. So which would conclude that Jesus was their Messiah. But if they responded from men, then the crowds of people would attack them because he was loved as a prophet by all the people. So to reject one of God's true prophets was to reject God. So now here we are. The Pharisees had really nowhere to go or not much to say. So they just responded with a, we don't know, right? You know, when you ask your kids, what do you want to do? We don't know. It's an easy way of saying an answer, but we really have no idea. So this is the Pharisees. They just went, we don't know. Jesus ended up winning this debate, though, because, you know, the answers of the religious leaders, initial question, who gives him authority, became rhetorical. So the answer was the same as that of the John the Baptist authority. So the meaning, Jesus' authority came from heaven. So now, Jesus doesn't simply drop the matter and leave, but he goes and let, no, he's not letting them off easy, okay? Jesus isn't an easy person. Instead, he tells a short parable and continues to question them in order to highlight the real issue and, no, their unbelief. So now, let's look at the parable, we find Jesus' conversion, conver conversation of the parable beginning in verse 28 through the f first part of verse 31. So I'm going to read it again. What, what do you think? 
Now when I read it, it'll kind of make sense, right? Earlier on, can I, uh, you didn't really know the context and the background, but now when I read it, you kind of understand, right? You'll, you have more meaning to it. So I'm going to read now. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. So now we understand who he's talking to, who is answering. All right? The key word in the word translated regret in the New Cream James Version is the Greek verb metamelomai. Metamelomai. If I say it faster, I might not be able to say it, but I'll try. Metamelomai, which have two meanings. It can mean to have regret about something in the sense that, you know, we, we, we wish it could have been undone or you know, we're very sorry, I regret what I did. Or it could also mean to change one's mind about something. No, without focus on regret, changing one's mind, having second thoughts. Either way, you know, the basic idea of this is repentance. So going back to the parable, there is one instruction from the father to both two sons, which was go work in my vineyard. What instruction was it? The work. When do they work? Was today. Where do they work? In my vineyard. Who works? Both sons. So now we get two different reactions from two different sons, from both sons, right? The first son reacted. He said, I will not. Meaning, no, he, he was rebelling. He rejected the command. His actions was, no, but after he acted with regret when he had time to think it through. Do some of us think through sometimes, you know, before we answer? Sometimes we kind of regret what we say to someone that has told us to do something. Maybe with our parents, right? They told us to do something, and then we, we say, no, no, nah, I don't want to do it. But then we kind of feel guilt and we regret what we said. So that's what happened to the first son. So the second son, he reacted with, I will go, sir. So no, he had respect for the father. He promised. He sounded nice. Maybe he looked nice. But you know, after in his action, he didn't do what he was told. He wasn't going to do it. He just was the word type, you know, or just yes, sir. And then he does his own thing. The point Jesus is trying to get across it's not hard to understand. You know, even for these Jewish leaders, the first son initially refused to obey and then regretted his decision and obeyed. While the second son first appeared to obey, but he never actually followed through. So the issue is genuine obedience that follows a change of heart versus pretended obedience. Right? So let me say again. The issue is genuine obedience that follows a change of heart. Just like the first son, he had a change of heart. So he had a genuine obedience versus the second son, which he pretended he had obedience. So right now, let's look at Jesus' explanation. No, the explanation of the parable. The explanation of the parable is found beginning the second part of the verse 31 and extends to verse 32. It says here, Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots, harlots are prostitutes. I, uh, harlots, that's like the old way of saying it. I guess we don't call them harlots anymore. But you know, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. He was telling these to the the, these Pharisees. For John, in verse 32, for John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. 
So the two sons parable at this point gets turned on the Pharisees. Jesus responds, truly, truly, I say to you, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will enter the kingdom of God before you. Boom. They must have been going, what? No, Jesus holds nothing back in his condemnation of these religious hypocrites. And there's no holds bar. This is about the Wild West. Jesus was throwing everything, even the tumbleweed. Doo, 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 right? He, there was no holding back for Jesus. Tax collectors were basically, you guys know tax collectors? Tax man? Dun, 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 dun. Were basically legal thieves back in the day who took all the money they could get. And then some, an extra. Right from the Jewish residents of Jerusalem. So you know, you trick them, they'd bully them, they'd strike fear in the residents in Jerusalem. So obviously, even now, some of us despise tax collectors. So how much more back then when they were like bullies, right? So they despise them, and especially by the Pharisees, right? Same as well as with the prostitutes. So the first son represented the tax collectors and the prostitutes. So you see, the tax collectors and prostitutes didn't initially agree with Moses and the prophets. However, when they heard John the Baptist preach, they believed and repented. Now they were the first son of the two sons in the parable. They didn't believe, but when they heard John, they repented and demonstrated their belief and loyalty to God. So they had that regret, that meta melomire experience where they regretted but what they did and had a change of mind. But the second son and the other end represented the Pharisees and scribes. They first agreed with the law and prophets, but when John the Baptist arrived, they didn't accept him. So Jesus stated, John the Baptist came and showed you how you should live, but you failed to believe him. Tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. So Jesus here was saying, you know, he was saying bluntly and stating facts to the Pharisees that, you know, why they probably wouldn't, wouldn't be allowed into heaven. John the Baptist's message about the baptism of repent repentance was the key to understanding the coming Messiah, and the Pharisees rejected the message. Now, these religious hypocrites should have noticed the worst sinners turning from their sins and believing God, right? They were there during the miracles of Jesus was happening. It was happening in front of the Pharisees, but they were too blind to see. They, they still couldn't see. They were blind. Now, Jesus said, you saw this happening but refuse to believe and repent of your sins. Because they rejected John the Baptist, they likewise rejected the Messiah and ultimately the Father who sent him. Earlier, if you look in uh, Luke 7, 33, 34, Jesus told the Pharisees here, you know, for John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The son of man had come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Hypocrites are like actors, okay? They had no foundation. So they didn't know the scriptures, while John and Jesus, they knew it well. And because of that, Jesus exposed them as fools. So here's the battle. Jesus talking to Pharisees, just like, th think of it as like the Wild West. And now Jesus are exposing them as fools. So these Pharisees aren't really feeling that too well right now. Now the point of the parable is clear now. Those who refuse God, but later repent and obey, like the first son, will go into the kingdom. And they will go in before those who say yes, but don't obey God, just like the second son. Now, Jesus gives a strong affirmation to this lesson when we say, no, truly I say to you, 
He's saying, take note. This is absolute truth. So strong affirmation. You know, when you hear your parents start to like raise their voice and say your full name, like Alexander Aruda, son of Edward, born in Iloilo. No, they don't say that. They say Alexander. But you know, that's the strong affirmation, right? They're ready to give you something important, right? They don't just say your nickname, Toto, right? They don't say that, especially when they're mad, right? Alexander, right? This is Jesus now. He didn't say, I don't know if he said their full names, but he said he was giving that affirmation. I'm going to try it. I'm not Jesus, but no, this, I think this is one, I'm going to think of when I'm affirming my child. Okay. Truly, I say to you, take note, this is absolutely the truth. That's Jesus, okay? Not me. He's, that's how he said it with affirmation. He didn't say, guys, truly, I say to you, this is absolutely the truth. No, 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 that won't work, especially, no. I, from experience with my kids, if you just say, like, guys, take it easy. No, that doesn't work. You can say, truly. Put that down. Do something else. Get off social media. Wife, I'm not wife. I mean, kid. <laughs> no, not, I'm sorry, not the wife. The kid. This is absolutely the truth. That's what Jesus is saying. So we notice Jesus forces them to answer now. The only possible answer to his question is that the first son that did the father's will. Yet the first son undeniably represents repentant sinners. So this moral outcast that these leaders look down on. And the leaders looked very much, right? But the leaders, these Pharisees, they very look much like the second son in that they did not take the message of the kingdom. Now this parable can be applied uh, pretty broadly. But in this context, Jesus applies it specifically to John the Baptist's ministry. That's why he's been giving him the example of John the Baptist. So the subject of the argument at this point between Jesus and the, Pharise- the leaders, the Pharisees in Jerusalem. All right. So in verse 32, we can look at it again. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and he did not believe him. Even though they said yes to obey God, they did not believe John was from God. So they didn't do what he said. Although John came in a way of righteousness, that is, he was righteous and preached a righteous message from God, they rejected him. Verse 32 also tells us, you know, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. So even though they had said no to God, they believed that John, they believed about John and they repented. So now Jesus here finally says in verse 32, and even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. So even after they saw others respond, they still rejected him and would not change their minds about him and heed his message of repentance. No, they failed it twice with John, just like they were failing it with Jesus as they spoke with him. Do you all understand the, the parable of the two sons? So now we're here, and we've learned what God wants from us. That you know, God wants us to believe and respond to the message of the kingdom. And you, know, you, you might ask yourself, so how do we, how do I respond? Or do we respond by saying yes or no to obeying God? Now, God is looking for a change within us that leads to obedience. Obedience to do our Heavenly Father's will and instead of anyone else's. That's what God wants from us. Let's, no, sometimes we might think, oh, what son should I be now? Let's not be like the second son. Now, as Christians, we've, we've said yes to God. Maybe we said yes, maybe just last year, maybe five years ago, maybe 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. Is there anyone a bit older? 40, 50 years, 
right? And so we are reminded in this parable that we need to come through on our commitment. We need to make sure we are working in the vineyard doing God's will, using our gifts and doing all that God tells us to do. So it doesn't matter if we've said yes. What matters is, are we doing God's will? Let me say that again. No, it doesn't matter if we said yes. No, we can always say yes. But what matters to God is, are we working in the vineyard? Are we doing His will? So it doesn't matter if you're 10 years old, 15 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, 50, 60. It doesn't matter because once we say yes to God, it's our obedience to doing His will. Just because we've said yes 10 years ago, that doesn't mean you know, um, we're still good. Right? It, it doesn't work like that. He wants us to be obedient and to be doing our Father's will instead of our own, maybe, or someone else's. Now, the second son also is similar in terms of in the verse Matthew seven twenty one. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. See, see here again. Just because, you know, we say he's our Lord, doesn't necessarily mean he'll enter heaven. You must come through on our commitments with God. Right, you know when we make a commitment, we don't just say yes and commit to something else. I know uh, we're talk, uh, we just kind of pray about how our anniversary, our CLC Scarborough's 10 years, 10 year anniversary, which is next month, amazing. Woo -hoo, listen, come on, guys, where's the affirmation here? You guys aren't ha happy? I'm happy. You know, when I first, uh, just a little off topic, you know, when I first came here 10 years ago, it, I wasn't happy. Because, you know, it wasn't like this. It was pretty hard, you know, starting a new church. It, 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 it's it really, not, I guess, stressful. But I mean, it, because we sometimes look at the outside and we're always impatient. We're like, God, where's your people? And it's just my family. I'm like, God, where's your people? I mean, but now seeing 10 years later, seeing these beautiful faces and, and what God is doing in our community, it's like, Wow amazing what not but not because we just said yes but because you know we've been obedient in doing the father's will right and you know rejoice was saying maybe we won't reach 11 year if you know if we're not united but you think of it we could just be like that fig tree you know how it had leaves we can reach 11th year 12th year 13 14 15 20 but you know it may look nice we might have those leaves but if we have no fruit that's what god is looking for you know we could still reach 11 12 I'm not saying rejoice was wrong. I'm just saying we can still reach those years. But if there is no substance, if there is no fruit, what's the point of reaching those anniversary? We're not just here happy 20th anniversary and we're still saying it to the same person. I'm not going to say happy 20th anniversary, same person, right? I want to make sure there's going to be more people that God is reaching out to. Amen? I mean, when I, when I another... Uh, example is when I got married. Now next year, not like next year, next month is our anniversary as well. So now there's two birds and one stone. Well, not a bird, but I mean, it's expensive. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I got to save. So, I mean, when, when we were, uh, when Pastor Jerry was marrying us, that what it's called now, I forgot already. When you're doing the ceremony, right? When we say, I do, meaning, you know, yes, right? I, imagine... I mean, if I didn't have the Father in my heart and I didn't have the faith and I didn't actually walk His will and His Spirit, no, it's easy not to be married after 12 years, right? But because, you know, we said yes. Yes, not to just to, be, to have the ring and, and have the paperwork and say, oh, I'm married. Yes, I'm married. But we said yes to being faithful. Yes to being fruitful, not just kids, but I mean fruitful in terms of, of also fruitful in our relationship where we bring together not only putting ourselves as 
idolizing each other, but bring ourselves closer to God, right? Saying yes, that no, we have a greater purpose, not just being in, in marriage and enjoying our own time, but you know what? knowing that God is the center of our relationship and he's brought us together for a real purpose and meaning and not just to, to just enjoy our company, right? And so I'm going back to the story and saying, you know, if I just said yes and didn't have any fruit or substance, I think I wouldn't be married for 12 years. I'd be like, okay, this is enough, right? It's the same way, you know, and God... Is speaking to us today. If he's speaking to you, and, and you know, the parable of the two sons, are we like the first where we regret the decisions we've made? Or are we like the second son where we always say yes, but there has no there is no fruit, there is no substance. No, we can look at our, our lives and, and see because you know a lot of times where we can say yes, but it's the fruit that God is is looking for let us not be self-righteous you know when we we are self-righteous we need that humility so we don't become like the leaders of jerusalem like those pharisees right you know when we always say i'm the best or it's all about me if you think about it who are the ones who will never repent Obviously, the sinners are going to repent, right? But there's a chance, you know, it's those who are self-righteous, they kind of like never repent because, you know, they think they don't need to repent. They're like, I'm, I'm good. I think I'm, uh, I'm okay. I don't need to repent to uh, God, you know. They don't see the need, right, when they're self-righteous because they're always thinking that they're right. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Paul says, Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. So this is a warning, not just to you guys, to, to myself as well. No, you never get to a place where you can't receive God's measures to you, where you don't need to open to repentance. So I'm going to end today. Can I call the worship team? And we're going to be singing this song. Yes, I will. And, you know, it's, it's a song where as we worship today, no, you're not worshiping me. No, God is, you're just using me as an instrument to deliver his message. And if he spoke to you today, if the Holy Spirit, you know, you feel the Holy Spirit talking to you, you know, let's all stand right now. And as the worship team starts singing, yes, I will. Now, if you're here today and, you know, there's sin in, our, in your life, just like the tax collector and the prostitute. I mean, I'm not calling you guys a prostitute, but I mean, if you, you, if you have that sin and you have made those terrible and shameful choices, you know, that if you feel that, those, that sin is so shameful that you still can't even, you're so embarrassed to even share it to your leader, it isn't too late. You know, if you haven't done God's will so far, maybe you're asking yourself, God, have I really done your will? I may have said yes, but really, have I really done your will so far? No, Jesus teaches us that you can't change, that you can change your mind, right? You can have a change within so that you believe the message and start to obey your heavenly father. Now, again, it isn't too late, just like the first son, right? The parable gives us two sons. We have the choice. It wasn't too late for him. He, he regretted and he was obedient. And if there's anyone today who wants to do this very thing, I invite you to the front because, you know, what kind of son or daughter are you? One who does the will of his father or one who says he will, but that's all to it. He just says he will and he didn't do anything about it. You know, how you respond to the commands of our God, to our Lord, determines 
the difference, right? This is now where we come and respond. Just like the Pharisees had a choice, Jesus gave them the choice to respond. Are you like the first son or are you like the second son? So I'm not just asking yourself, I'm asking myself as well, am I like the first son? Am I like the second son? Right? We have that choice. We aren't created like robots or we have no choice. God has given us a choice where we can be obedient today. No, it's not too late. If you feel like you're old, physically, old mentally, it's still not too late. If you're here standing right now and you chose to stand, you have that choice to be like the first son and regret what you have done in the past and you can still be obedient and be able to do the Father's will. We're singing this song, Yes, I Will. Yes, I will. Now, if you just say, yes, I will, we need to remind ourselves, well, what are we saying yes to? Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. The lowest point in your life, you can still say, yes, I will. Just like the first son, right? Maybe... He didn't want to, but and then he reached that lowest point in life. He's, he regretted it, and he became obedient, and he said, yes, I will. Yes, I will bless your name. You know, I sing for joy when my heart is heavy. If he asks people today, maybe your coworkers who don't know Jesus, or, or friends, or, or students, and most likely... You'd never see them have joy if their heart is heavy, right? Have you ever seen a coworker that's so stressed out and he's smiling and say, yo, bro, I'm so stressed out, right? That doesn't happen, right? But you know what? If we have Jesus in our hearts and say, yes, I will, we can still sing for joy. You know, we can still have that peace. And it's not just today that we say yes, but it's in all my days that we can say yes, I will. Because even today we can say yes. You know what? I've said this before. I've done it. I've said yes. And it's the next day, it's like, wow, God, how can I say yes again? But you know, we still need to make that choice. I know every day, yes, I will. Yes, I will lift you high. And so today, you know, we get to choose to worship Him and to praise Him and give Him glory. So as we sing this, as our worship team starts to sing, I invite you to the front because, you know, today I can't make that choice for you. I wish I can, you know, I'd love to take you guys all in my heart and make that choice, but I can't. I don't have enough space. But you know what? Jesus has the heart. He has that love for you all. And as we decide and be obedient, you know, we come to the front not to show our neighbor, our family, our friends that, you know what, I'm, okay guys, I'm obedient. It's not a show, but you know, look in your own heart. We're here coming to the front because, you know, we're here to speak to God and receive Him and surrendering to Him our life and just saying, you know what, God, I regret what I've done and I'd love to just be obedient to Your will. And yes, here I am, Father. So today, as they start to sing, I invite you to the front and we're here to pray for you and just a moment where we can worship God our Father. You know, just like the two sons, the Father gave commands to do His work. And if we want to do His work, we can't do it alone, but you know, the Holy Spirit is here to strengthen us. Amen? So let's just, just be in worship right now.